um, brought to you by Monroe Actories. Um, my name is Charles Duplessis, and as you can see, I'm in self-isolation in a cabin for a while now. This was me some time before. I'm an actuary, and I've worked at old, oh, sorry, at, at Monroe Actories uh, since 2009, uh, with a two-year gap overseas, and then returned to 2012, and been full-time since then. On the agenda today uh, are the following items. Uh, some housekeeping, Christine Miller will be online and assisting me answering questions. Uh, if there's anything that I miss, she's worked at Munro actually since 2014. Uh, and uh, yeah, otherwise also everyone is muted, um, video and mics. So this is to prevent delays and buffering. But if you have any questions throughout the session, you can just type them in the Q&A or use the chat. And um, you can do this at any time or at the end, we will have a, a dedicated uh, session for it as well. And Christine will try and answer some in the interim that I might miss, but also at the end, otherwise we will cover them again. And um, we can also send them out via email afterwards to those interested. Then there will also be a quick survey when we leave. We appreciate you completing it and value your feedback. Okay. So, First off, I'm going to talk a little bit about industrial psychologist joint minutes. I'm going to start here since we encounter many more of these than requests for actual joints, and also rightly so. Um, the fact, though, is that they can often lead to considerable uncertainty, and actuaries will then interpret them differently, or they might be instructed to do so. And this leads to a request for an actuarial joint minute that could have been avoided had the IPs been more clear in their joint minute. All right, I'm just gonna, you know, for some context, provide some um, some quotes from the Ntombela uh, judgment of about a year or so ago, and also the, the Gauteng Practice Directive. So the first one, expert reports must be drafted in a format designed for lucidity, brevity, and conveniently cross-referencing, and to this end must be in numbered paragraphs. All right, next one. Where there are overlapping experts, the experts produce joint minutes indicating their endeavor to settle and failing settlement, narrowly defining their differences. Joint minutes must identify exactly what is agreed and what is not agreed, with the reasons stated why agreement cannot be achieved, especially as to whether this agreement relates to a fact clinically observed or an interpretation of facts. So on this last point, we don't ever clinically observe anything, we just see the instructions from other experts that have assessed the claimant naturally, but we don't ever assess the claimant. So, so these uh, comments are obviously more aimed, uh, aimed at the other specialists, um, but you know, the others also to ask the numbering and so forth. Um, then some uh, comments uh, on the industrial, college joint, industrial psychologist joint minutes that we encounter, some common problems from a calculation perspective. Um, bearing in mind that one of the primary purposes of the joint minute is to come to an agreement for calculation purposes. This doesn't mean it has to be one scenario, but more than two or three is not helping any more, anyone and probably not optimal. Um, so you can assume that the actuary is only going to receive this one document to calculate the loss and therefore all earnings information is required. Um, so here's one quote that we often see. We refer to our initial reports for earnings details. So the final calculation should be based on a joint minute, not in the separate reports. And the separate reports, you know, often differ, and often we don't have access to to both um, both those reports. Um, the differences are based on reported earnings. We defer to factual collateral. Well, if the IPs don't have the collateral, then neither do we, most likely. For settlement, should we use the average or their figures, or are these differences significant? And two calculations should be done. Okay, so some examples of uncertainty. The past career history between the accident and the joint minute is not discussed um, to the full extent, but it differs in the initial, in the initial reports. Uh, for example, the claimant was unemployed or not. So it could often be that the claimant was unemployed at the date of the initial report, but has since secured employment. Uh, all details should be indicated in the joint minute dates um, and so forth. They defer to other experts who differ on a key point, resulting in hugely different career or earnings possibilities. 
Uh, at this point, it would be optimal to get those differences ironed out before the actuaries do the calculations. Figures like Patterson are not provided. So often Patterson sources differ in the initial reports, for example, PE Corporate or Deloitte or Koch. So actuaries will use the different figures and arrive at quite different results. Uh, also, the IPs do not specify whether it's corporate basic or corporate total package or the more recently published stats essay figures. These all have significant impact on the calculation and we only have access to the Koch figures or those provided by the IPs. We don't subscribe to any of the other earnings surveys. IPs agree on basic salaries, but they do not mention the benefits suggested in their initial reports or that we can see in the collateral provided or that the other actually can perhaps see in the collateral provided to them, again, causing differences in our calculations then. IPs agree on a scenario or scenarios, but also provide alternative, often speculative scenarios. The purpose is for settlement and multiple scenarios adds confusion and not clarity. This is a, uh, a quote that we see very often in, in uh, IP joint minutes. We suggest these uncertainties be addressed by appropriate contingencies. The key question then is, is this the only source of the loss or is it an addition to a direct loss? And an example is then, you know, we've seen actuaries interpret this very differently. Could perhaps be an instruction, but we've seen um, joint minutes where it's pretty clear that the claimant will at best maintain his current employment he might retire early and then the uninjured there was some career growth suggested but if the sentence is there so, you know it could mean you know is the, the lack of career growth and the early retirement all to be addressed by contingencies and therefore we must set the, the uninjured and injured careers equal with only contingencies being the loss or is contingencies in addition to the to the direct losses of early retirement or, or lower career ceiling so this comes up quite often and is often a huge um, point of dispute then uh, the one IP states retirement age 60 to 65, the other one to age 65. We tend to, in these scenarios, we tend to use age 65 uh, mainly because people will need to, to work longer in the future because lifespans are increasing and also they'll be able to work longer because health spans are increasing. Uh, these are both worldwide trends and expected to continue. And you know it's been observed in, in quite a few other countries that the retirement ages are shifting, are shifting to later ages. Right, then um, the next item on the agenda is actuarial joint minutes. So just to set the scene for the next few slides, which are quite detailed, we estimate that less than, less than one in 10 requests for actuarial joint minutes will add real value to the process. Courts have warned experts about producing valueless reports and rightly so, given it's mostly taxpayer money, money funding these. However, this conflicts with court procedures or pressure from a judge who demands an actuarial joint minute since the actuaries arrive at different answers. So we are trying to, to prevent this from happening whenever possible. So we've distributed this uh, infographic a uh, while ago and you may have seen it before, but I'm just gonna talk through it briefly. So uh, like I've mentioned, actuarial joint minutes are really required, uh, why? It's because the reports quantifying the damages are based on the inputs of other experts, including industrial psychologists, other medical legal assessors, or forensic accountants. The methods and assumptions used in the calculations are aligned across the actuarial discipline. So the optimal procedure is if all inputs are agreed upon by the industrial psychologist or the, or the attorneys, then a single actuary can actually perform the final calculation in most cases because um, we've mostly experienced that, you know, the same values in equals the same values out. And I'll just cover some exceptions, you know, in the next few slides. So why do discrepancies arise? Mostly we would, in our opinion or in our experience, mostly it's when the input differ or when the inputs um, are vague. So again, the opposite of the above theorem, different values in, you'd expect different values out. So an example would be, even if we do the calculation on the same joint minute, but the IP did not specify whether to use basic salaries or total packages or straight line or step increases between promotions, it's for the IPs to advise on what to use and not the actuaries. But the actuaries might, might have a different um, assumption you know, or instruction again in, in such circumstances. So steps to take before requesting joint minutes. 
so yeah, re-examine all the inputs by asking were the IP reports provided the same, you know, were any of the other collateral different pay slips, for example, uh, was there specific in attorney instructions, perhaps only doing a certain scenario or, um, or omitting a certain scenario. Um, and lastly, with, you know, with a proposed contingency is different. Um, this is also not an actuarial input, but, you know, often leads to a, to a big difference in the final result. In these cases, actuaries can assist by examining the reports and highlighting the differences and compiling a sensitivity report showing the financial impact of each of these differences. And I'll go through that in a bit more detail in a, in a later slide as well. So if the inputs are, are unambiguous and clear, most actuaries will arrive at a similar result when given the same set of inputs. And similar is, I mean, I'm just gonna um, expand on that a little bit. So the Actuarial Society of South Africa has a damages committee of which we're members of. We meet quarterly with the aim of discussing and aligning our methods and assumptions. Um, we've also agreed on a joint minute template for consistency recently. So you may start seeing some of those when we do do joint minutes. So however, having said that some differences still exist and I'll cover these in the next few slides, but they usually have quite a minor impact on the final result compared to the earnings related input and contingencies. Also, none of us use the exact same model. So minor differences will always exist. Uh, up to 2% of differences in capital values are taken as normal. Examples could be uh, increased month or discounting the mid-month, so, so quite technical, but not really important to the final result. Um, so joint minutes only add value when the actuarial methods and assumptions used to perform calculations on the same set of inputs differ between the actuaries. And lastly, so, yeah, and then a successful joint minute, just a final comment there, a successful joint minute involves two professionals of equal standing in their disciplines. A joint minute is used as evidence in court and is required to be honest, substantiated, objective testimony that distinguishes material fact from assumptions and opinions. It sets out points of agreement and disagreement between the experts. So an alternative to a joint minute is also to settle between the results by different actuaries, assuming that the earnings input are agreed upon and, and interpreted the same way. Okay, next I'll just cover a few of the common actuarial differences that still exist. Um, the first one being the mortality. So we use the South African life tables of 1984 to 1986 and we use life table two. So just some context on these tables before I, uh, I go further. They were classified along, they were produced in 1984 to, to 1986. They were classified along racial lines with only tables for white and colored populations being constructed from the actual data. Why so old, you might ask? Well, the, these are the most recently available public tables that's, um, that excludes the, the effect of the HIV pandemic and um, antiretroviral treatments have mostly removed the impact of HIV, meaning that any tables that, that includes the impact of HIV on the population is, is not relevant to use at the moment. Um, also, various parties are looking at constructing updated life tables, but this has been, you know, turning out to be to be um, quite a job because of, you know, various other factors. Um, insurance companies are not not um, very keen to share their their data and so forth. So it's, you know, and then the census data is the only other data that that's that's available. Um, so these life tables, you'll have probably noted this. There's, there's six tables. Um, they were mapped to certain earn earnings levels. Uh, we're not quite sure how, um, but it's been done some years ago by, by, by Robert Koch. So tables two and table five equals the white and the colored uh, tables of, of those years. Table one assumes lower mortality than table two. And then tables three and four are blends of tables two and five. And then six is heavier mortality than table five. So, as you can see, only tables two and five is based on real data. All the other ones are quite random blends of, of those two tables. Um, and then the impact is usually very small compared to the, to the non-actuarial differences um, and contingencies. Again, meaning that you know, if, if we differ on life table, it might just be optimal to settle in between our results if this is the only difference. So why do we use life table two? Well, the South African life expectancy has improved since these tables were produced, um, but these are the most optimistic table 
based on real data that's publicly available at the moment. Worldwide improvement in life expectancy have been observed. The rate of improvement has been higher in developing countries such as ours, and we also expect this trend to continue. The racial construct of the tables is fundamentally discriminatory, and all South Africans have, in the interim, got access to better healthcare and economic opportunities. There's three judgments that support the case to remove racial classification, and they are listed below. Okay, the next um, slide, I'm just gonna cover um, another common difference, which is how we treat pension benefits, and especially when it's a defined benefit fund. Just for some context, the defined benefit fund is a fund where your pension is essentially defined in terms of your final salary and your years of service. So it's usually formula driven. The government example, the government uh, employees uh, pension fund being the prime example. So um, you have a certain accrual uh, formula that you know your years of service and your salary when you retire basically determines your pension at retirement. Um, your both you and your employer still make contributions, but these are not related to your final benefits. The other, uh, the other common one is a defined contribution fund. As the name suggests, only the contributions are defined. So both, again, both you and your employer most likely will make contributions, but these contributions are rolled up in, essentially in your own private fund. And together with you know, the, the, the time that it's invested and the investment return on those funds, this will determine how much money you've got available at retirement. Then at retirement, you've got uh, option to buy various pension products that's available in the open market. So, so in this case, your, the pension that you receive won't directly be related to your salary or your years of service. Although naturally, the longer you've contributed, the higher your pension should be. Okay, so we normally value a defined benefit pension fund as a defined contribution. And there is some exceptions such as when, you know, the person is, is very close to retirement or has already retired early in the interest state, perhaps, um, then it's probably most, um, optim you know, most um, realistic to, to, to actually value it uh, on the defined benefit method. But I'll just cover below then why we, we typically use the defined contribution method. So, so this entails valuing the difference in the contributions made instead of the differences in the benefits paid between the uninjured and injured careers. So looking at it accounting wise, you accrue or earn your pension while you're working. And then after you retire, it's paid. So it's simply a drawdown or a payment of the pension, but it's not being earned at that time. So, so this means that we only consider this means that we only need to consider the period from the date of accident to retirement. And there's some, there's some uh, advantages of, of, of this approach, which is as follows. Um, it ignores service accumulated before the accident. So defined benefits, defined benefit benefits accrue from prior to the accident um, and the loss is therefore not fully attributable to accident for, for those benefits that's been accrued before the accident. This is particularly so for a lot of support guys where the dependents will receive death benefits based on the service, um, you know, upon death of the, of the member. Um, so it also ensures broad consistency between claimants earning at the same capacity. Um, so people can uh, still change jobs. They're often still far from retirement, so they could move between private and, and, and uh, government sector, for example. Uh, it av further avoids projection of around 30 or so more years to the advanced ages. So if we had to consider the benefits paid after retirement, then essentially from age 65 until you know death, we would still have to uh, to value the, the benefits and there's increasing uncertainty and especially with mortality at older ages, the data is, is very scant um, at those ages. So the tables aren't very reliable. Then also it can avoid a strange impact of the cap on the lump sums where you have a, a, a government employee who, who is postulated will retire early in the injured state. So on this early retirement, there's a, there's a gain when the, the GPF lump sum pays out, but this is, not capped because it's a gain, but the loss on the normal retirement is then capped 
and this then leads to strange results on the gap, of the cap on the on the losses. And then the final difference that we've observed uh, as as a regards pension is that we allow for tax breaks on the pension contributions, um, but that yeah we've seen not that not not all other actuaries do this, arguing that uh, the claimant will eventually end up paying tax. So this is true, but our argument is that the delay of the tax liability is definitely worth something, and it's also most likely going to be at a lower marginal rate because mostly people's pension would be lower than their earnings before they retire. Uh, and then also they have um, there's slightly higher uh, tax rebates for for retire for for pensioners than for for employed persons. Okay, and then other benefits, some differences, you know, that's mostly related to either the differences in the fact provided or their interpretation. So, the, for example, do we only look at the basic salary or basic plus fringe benefits? Some examples of fringe benefits other than, than pension that I've already covered is medical aid, bonus allowances, um, such as housing or uniform allowances or car allowances. Um, a big one, also variable earnings, often uh, commission or overtime earnings is, is quite a large part of, of somebody's total remuneration. This can be seasonal and so therefore depends on which pay slips you look at. Um, and, you know, so therefore if we look at different pay slips than the other actually, then we, we won't arrive at the same results necessarily. Another common uh, problem we've encountered is that um, there's no pre-accident pay slips available and therefore we have to be using the post-accident level of overtime for the uninjured as well, which might then miss a, a section of the loss um, if, they, if the person could have earned more overtime before the accident. So it also depends whether we have actual data like pay slips or RP5s or if there's a salary survey being relied upon so consider, for example, a student versus a graduate. If we do a, a calculation now for a student, then we would only be, have a salary survey to rely upon, probably a career path suggested by the IPs. If we do an update next year and the person is now a graduate and working, then we might have pay slips. And so therefore, if we don't include all the benefits from the pay slip, then it will be not compatible with the previous calculation where the salary survey probably relied on, on full packages. So, so therefore, um, it, it ensures, like I've said in the previous slide as well, it ensures consistency between claimants earning at the same capacity by valuing all the benefits. So, so if you're in the government sector, for example, your pension has no immediate value to you, but you are still accruing it. Uh, whereas if you're in the private sector, your pension actually accrues to you as you're working. You can see your fund at any given moment. You can see how much you've saved up. Whereas in the government, you, you don't see that, but it still accrues. Then it also ensures consistency between loss of support and loss of earnings claims. So here we can consider the impact of death versus somebody who's unemployable. So if a claimant is critically injured in an accident and unemployable, and we value his lost capacity based on his full earnings capacity, um, you know, including his pension and his medical aid, then to ensure consistency, had the same claimant died instead of the critical injury, to, to ensure the same financial position um, of the family estate before and after, you know, for the deceased person, we would then also have to value, you know, all the benefits that we would have valued had he simply been, been unemployable. Um, you know, this will then ensure that, you know, all the benefits um, are shared by, by the dependents. So, so even, so, so the argument made by other actuaries often, you know, especially with pension and medical aid is that the um, dependents might not share in these. Uh, our argument is that there should at least be an indirect benefit to dependents, even if there's no direct benefit. So for example, um, consider a medical aid that perhaps only covers the, the principal member, but not the children. So if two people, you know, in this, earning the same basic salary, but one has a medical aid that covers only himself, that person, in theory, should still have more um, money available to support his dependents because his medical aid um, uh, liabilities are taken care of by his by his employer. So, so therefore, we we value the um, the full earnings capacity. The other uh, reason being that there's um, there's often not a choice in the benefit design. So, if you're at the government, you 
belongs to their compulsory medical aid, you belong to their um, defined benefit pension fund. Okay, and then last item on the agenda is the, um, the actual comparison as an alternative to joint minutes. So this is a, a document that simply just lists all the differences, the actuarial and the non-actuarial ones um, in a table format. We provide a comment on our approach, um, almost as if we're doing a joint minute, so positioning why we've done what we've done. Uh, these comments allow earnings rather than input to be clarified by the IPs rather than actually arguing on how it should be interpreted. Um, so uh, one of the advantages of this is that it's faster. There's no need to engage the other actuary. In our experience of doing joint minutes, we often find that it's days rather than hours before they get back to us. So there's often quite a long turnaround time for, act for, for compiling these joint minutes. And uh, we value, you know, the, the fast turnaround times that, that we've been able to offer, and you know, and and this would en enable us to to continue to do so. Um, so now I'm just going to show you a quick example of a sensitive sensitivity analysis that we've done a while back on quite a complicated case. Um, so, so this is um, this was a, a foreign earnings case. So as you can see, the first item is the exchange rate. Um, so our total loss was 5.7 million and the other actually was only about 2.88 million. So then what we do is we change all the assumptions that differ, you know, whether it's our assumptions or the input rated assumptions. Uh, we change them and this, this was in no particular order, but then just to, to assess what the impact is of each. Uh, and then with the final one being something that we can't explain, the number seven, you know, we say is, is either, you know, we, we, we're not sure what the difference is or it's, you know, perhaps the, the minor model dif differences that I've alluded to before. So, so in this case, you can very quickly see that the most important differences wa was with the earnings tax, you know, with, you know, the foreign earnings expressed was, it wasn't clear whether this was before or after tax. And this made by far the biggest difference. And this is not an actual input. This has to be clarified by the, by the earnings specialists. The next biggest difference was the exchange rates. So, uh, you know, do you use the exchange rates of, of now or the exchange rates, um, you know, for each period where the losses was incurred. And you can see the life table made a very small difference, 1,4% only contingencies, state of calculation. So, so this basically just gives you an illustration of, of you know, um, of you know where the key points are that is perhaps worth arguing. So it can therefore be more useful in aiding settlement than a joint minute, um, in our opinion. Okay, so that's pretty much it for now. Um, so this yeah it brings us to the question and answer session. I'm just going to see. I haven't seen any questions yet, but um, you are welcome to post any now if if you do have any. Um, and just also to note that uh, the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Also, any questions afterwards are most welcome as always. Yeah, and um, we, we value your time and your business and we appreciate your feedback after the session. Um, still not seeing any comments or questions, but um, here is the team and our contact details. So we're um, available to serve you now from the comfort of our own home rather than from that office. But the impact, you should not notice the difference. We all are online and, and ready. So, so yes, if you have any, anything, I'm gonna stay around for a while and, and see if there's, if there's any questions coming up. But thanks so much for listening and have a good rest of your lockdown.